I've got some slides, but <coughs> let's try and make it as interactive as we can. Um, a fairly small audience. I don't know particularly what you're most likely to talk about, but uh, what I've uh, prepared slides about is really where we are with BCS generally, our strategy, uh, some current issues, <coughs> and then I've also got one on the um, student engagement, which is uh, my theme for the year. I'm thinking of obviously the event you said I'd talk about student engagement, so indeed I will. Um, and, uh, but please do um, interrupt me whenever you like. Um, I have actually put some slides in and some, some questions I've requested feedback. Um, so there are my topics, as I've just said. Yep. Um, recent changes in BCS structure, if you're really interested, but I guess most of people are not interested. In so um, I centered this around our strategy as an organization, partly because we've just been through a process of uh, Redeveloping uh, what we call a strategic plan. And what you see on the screen there um, is what we call the five pillars well, the, the mission and the vision. And then the five pillars, <coughs> pillars of our strategy, so they're kind of the ongoing themes. We've had those for, I think they were written about seven or eight years ago. Um, and we, we've stuck with, with them. We are thinking of reviewing them maybe in a year's time, but they're still our current strategic pillars. Uh, I've actually now got a slide on each one of them, but as you can see, the range of what we aspire to do and to be is very broad. Um, you know, it goes from education through professionalism, through public policy, um, maybe one benefits, and then the international angle as well. So that's an enormously wide agenda if we uh, are able to, to, to do it. So we have to be selective in what we do. And, um, that sometimes does give us problems. So starting then with uh, the, the first of those bridging the gap between education, practice and research. Um, and the first point there really is um, what, we, what we'd like to see. Uh, more people to be able to present this side of the um, young people to be educated with 21st century computing skills and motivated to learn to study outdoor careers in IT. Um, we know that we don't, not enough young people choose um, computing at school level and certainly at university level. That's been a, a disappointment for, for many years now. Um, we also know that we don't get enough. Sorry, yeah. I have a question. Just, just a Broad question, yeah. Um, I'm sure that's absolutely fine. That's absolutely that's, that's well, great. Um, is it a thought perhaps to introduce the idea of IT in almost every discipline? Because when it comes to work, an awful lot of the IT work that we have to do is sorting out the unholy mess that people who think they know something actually don't, you know, they all do. So it's just a thought. But you said, you know, move into IT, and that's all right. Um, I suppose I'm going to give a little EA fix about the fact that people in IT know about IT. But it seems that people who aren't in IT just don't know anything. And they're wrong customers, and they're wrong practitioners. I mean, they are. They're wrong. <coughs> they <coughs> Maybe a thought. Yeah, no, that's no, a very good thought. I, mean, I, I don't have an answer, really. I'm sorry, not really an answer. Um, you know, one of our one of these five is ensuring everyone benefits from IT. It's not quite the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, I, mean, I will come on to talk these other, these four points on here, which um, do represent a, a really big change in the UK uh, education scene. Um, whether that uh, whether whether getting more kids. You know, having had a proper IT course at school, will that actually help your point or make it worse? I don't know because you know, a little knowledge could be an addition. <laughs> but um, I will uh, just uh, go through these points. So, driving school curriculum change, uh, as of uh, let's say go back, back two years, um, Secretary of State uh, Michael Gove um, was saying publicly that. IT as it was taught in schools um, was a redundant, dead, useless subject. And actually, most of us would probably agree in terms of 
how it was taught and what was being taught. Um, still the case today. Um, and we, we did face the prospect of it actually dropping out of the school curriculum altogether. And various uh, people ourselves, but, but also some, some, some quite, quite sort of big hitters in, in, in the world at large, um, like um, the Google um, to the exact name. That's right. He made a speech um, saying he was in our money that we don't. This country, which is you know kind of the, the cradle of computer science, and uh, that, that we're we're not doing it in schools, or we're not doing it well in schools. Um, so politicians take notice when people like that say those sort of things. Um, and then we got the opportunity. Various activities took place, but the biggest one of those was um, a report which we produced jointly with the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, and uh, no, sorry, with the with Royal Society. And um, that um, got it onto the political agenda, if you like, those, those different activities got the political agenda. And uh, our director, Bill Mitchell, um, has been working with the Department for Education over, the, over this last period and has achieved great success in terms of the school curriculum now does include as a statutory subject um, computing. Um, it's a very different subject to the old IT uh, courses that have been taught in schools uh, in that it will include um, you know, real computer coding, it will include you know, appreciation of um, how computers are made and, and how they work um, and it will include important subjects like cyber security for example. So um, it will be quite a wide ranging curriculum which will um, give people a much deeper understanding of computing and not just as users, which is the problem with the old courses, it taught people how to use Microsoft Office and computers, but um, didn't really teach any particular understanding of computers, but that's the, that's the new curriculum which, uh, as I say, has now been accepted and um, because we have been so successful in uh, in campaigning for that, of course, they've now led back on us um, to to actually make this happen. Because the biggest problem with it is the uh, lack of skills among the teaching community in schools. And we consider this actually extends down to primary schools. That's then certainly a bigger problem. So we have um, a, a, a body called Computing at School. Website, um, which is a kind of um, ground up movement of teachers, interested teachers who actually want to make this happen. Um, and I was, you know, we had a branches convention today, by the way, and uh, Tom Crick, one of our council members, who uh, is uh, active, he chairs CAS, the Computing School for Wales. And we've seen their membership since the start of. Started last year, the membership has gone from 500 to nearly 7,000 know, teachers who want to get into the new curriculum and uh, working together in a cooperative way to uh, just up, up their skills as a teaching profession in schools. Um, then the um, there are two more specifically funded activities there. Um, the teaching network of excellence is a bit like CASIS, but it's um, a cooperative venture funded by the DfV uh, between universities and schools. And uh, so the, the idea here is you have they will, they will appoint master teachers who will then have to promulgate uh, good practice on a reasonable basis. Uh, and then the uh, teaching scholarships, again funded by DfV, uh, again. And they've asked us to administer, so um, the top pupils to go through university with scholarships to um, hopefully they become the master teachers of the future in, in computing in schools. So uh, that's the, um, the set of activities under that heading uh, that you know, form the prominent part of our strategy going forward. Now, 
it's been a great success, and if, if you read about BCS in the general press, it's more likely it'll be about this subject, about the school curriculum, than anything else. Um, it's where we've actually made a difference. Um, <coughs> which is great, um, but it does mean that we do have to deliver on you know, a very ambitious program of teacher training. Uh, secondary school curriculum starts next year, um, and it's included. It's one of the uh, core subjects in the EVAC at UCSE as well. Um, so there's a tremendous upskilling over a short time period, and we do have to make sure it's that. Uh, it doesn't fall flat on its face because um, the teaching profession is not uh, capable of delivery. And the other point there is that uh, this bridging the gap, um, you know, originally was really more about um, at the university level, bridging the gap between university industry practice, and uh, that part of the the BCS Academy has, has really had to take a back seat because. Um, and the resource available um, is Bill Mitchell and, and one or two staff, and, and they you know, have to devote themselves, themselves to the, the, the school curriculum. Um, and the other part, the, the, um, the G part of, of their job, has, 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 has suffered a little. So, uh, overall, a success, a success story for us. So, this is the um, one of the five pillars about professionalism, and there's a lot, you know, one, one could say on this. Um, obviously, promotion of the value of IT professionalism is very much our our main focus as a, as, a, as an institute. Um, I was collared today at the branches convention, saying, "Well, what are we doing? Why can't we do more?" Uh, in influencing employers into requiring um, professional qualification or preferring professional qualification uh, when they're recruiting IT staff. Um, it's, um, it's done a little bit. We have some you know, really good firms who are um, they're probably corporate members of BGS uh, um, who do do this, but most don't. And if the firms Recruiting people don't um, value particularly professionalism or professional qualification, uh, then uh, we're not going to persuade young people to actually get qualified um, through our qualifications. So that's always and continues to be a big issue for us. Um, what uh, you'll see on the BCS website. Um, some career path information that's actually improved quite a lot and is being improved further. The second point there um, about level three, um, that's level three in Sapphire. You probably know Sapphire seven level model. Of, the seven levels are the kind of seniority levels going from one as a trainee up to seven as a, as a sort of top strategic CIO. Um, our professional qualification CITP, um, Chartered IT Professional, is pitched at level five in that seven level um, structure. So it does mean that <clears throat> an aspiring young IT professional has got quite a long way to go. Um, and that, that, that level five is a fairly senior post within a, a typical IT department. So they've got quite a big um, way to go before they can get the CITP after their names and chartered qualification. So we've wanted for a long time to have uh, something at level three, which is kind of the intermediate, intermediate level on that, on that route. Um, and what we'd lacked, of course, would be funding to develop, to develop this. Uh, fortunately, uh, Lord Sainsbury and his charity, his educational charity, which is called the Gatsby Foundation, are keen to establish what they call Technician qualifications across all professions, many professions, and engineering professions and, and IT are certainly one of the one of the main targets. So, after a very lengthy negotiations involving other engineering professional bodies, which were that happy about what we had planned, and you can imagine the kind of uh, machinations that go on. But finally, we just 
a few months ago, we actually got that committed funding from the Gatsby Foundation, and over the next couple of years, we will be creating this level three qualification. It will be called technician, which is not a word that's um, very attractive, but we're, we're, that's a condition for Gatsby that it, the word technician comes in the title. But what it does do for us is gives us a, a stepping stone or a career path in IT you know, at that intermediate level um, and uh, by way of a general purpose IT qualification is something that's tested and um, has to be renewed and has to be kept up with continuing professional development. My third point there, um, again, if you've looked at the website recently, you've probably seen the new CPD tools on the website, you know, pages on there. The main uh, product there being something called Personal Development Plan, PDP, um, which is the recording where you're able to record uh, the events you go to, like tonight's event, if, if, you, if you would like to. Um, and in a typical CPD fashion, you know, the reflective bit of what did you learn from it, and what, what, what's next you're going to do in terms of your continuous professional um, so we're very proud of that. It works, you know, it was very well received. Uh, the take up of it was well in excess of expectations over the first few weeks. Um, and we've got further plans to develop it so that, for example, um, we will publish an, an API program interface so that training providers from their records of people who have attended courses could feed directly into the EDP of those people. So it then becomes a kind of, um, you know, sort of accredited personal record with evidence there that these things have been done rather than just your own say so. So it becomes a portable um, career record for people. And uh, not, uh, as far as we're aware, no other professional body quite has anything like this. So we're really, you know, very pleased with the potential for that. And again, thinking about attracting youngsters into the profession, it's, um, it's a really good tool for, for young people early in their career. So that's that. Um, yeah, uh, the other um, things, increased membership. Uh, we, we do, we have been increasing membership. Um, uh, the word I use is steadily, so you know, a small percentage this year, which actually over the last few years is quite the cheap many professional bodies have suffered really badly under the under the recession. Um, but we need to drive it up much more. Uh, our total membership is 70,000. That's compared to at least a million people who work in IT or you know, related areas, at least a million. So it's you know, well under 10%. And of those um, 70,000, sort of only 50,000 of those are what you call professional. CS, um, doing great. Um, so we do want to drive membership up, and the only way we'll do that is by the kind of things I've already mentioned, uh, that demonstrating that employers value professional qualification and what we do, and that individuals value the services we provide, things like BDP, and of course the activities and branches. So, you know, we, it, it's something that, um, again, at the local level, branches can, can help with in terms of uh, demonstrating uh, the value of, of what you're doing. I mentioned earlier for branch meetings and the speakers you had. Um, I won't go on that cohesion and engagement, obviously quite a problem for such a diverse organisation and uh, the geographical spread that we've got. Interested to hear your own views on that. Um, Students and young professionals, I've got a slide about that later on. Um, and as it says here, member groups as a key channel for promoting professionals. And so these are items that are in our strategic plan with activities against them. I won't go into greater detail. Informing public policy um, to an extent, what we've done with the um, Department for Education is an example of that. Um, but it's not the only one. Uh, we, we do um, influence air, other areas. I mean, uh, another part of the public sector, another part of central government is, is health. Um, 
where we've worked, um, health executive has worked with the Department for Health in developing guidance for patients on safe record keeping. And um, another one would be a founder member of a standards body for data interchange within health. Um, so, you know, just absolutely core things that we should do as, as an IT professional body. Um, we have the policy hub, which is well worth looking at and subscribing to. So, when we get things like government consultations that are coming to us, it's a chance for all members, any members who are interested, to contribute towards that process. Um, and that's been developing well. And we want to, um, <coughs> as it says there, appoint um, more spokesperson so that we actually, when things blow up in the press, that we actually have a spokesperson ready to respond quickly. That's been our failing in the past, but other people tend to grab the airwaves, so to speak. And it's been largely because we haven't had people ready um, and able to, uh, to respond quickly, and that's something we're working on. Uh, increased profile, first political presence. One thing we did this autumn, for example, was we uh, organised events, uh, not with the Dems, but at the Labour and Conservative Party conferences. So, and they went down very well. And it was a fringe events, but we got MPs and experts uh, along to, to speak at them, and it's another way to promote it to get, you know, with, with, with that particular constituency. Ensuring everyone benefits, um, there's been a lot of effort. Well, the gender issue, of course, is a very long standing one. The, the poor gender mix in, in IT professions, which has always been there. Um, I recently signed, um, on behalf of BCS, a call, a call out of all the engineering professions to drive up diversity in general, but in particular, focus on um, the gender balance. Um, that's being led by uh, Professor Wendy Moore, who was a previous president, based at Southampton uh, University, and she's been campaigning on this, as she said, at the launch, you know, for 20, 30 years. And things have not improved much over all those years. You know, the number of women going into IT, um, either at university level or into, uh, into work, is still very low, and it's low compared to other countries. You know, we go to Singapore or somewhere like that, so you'll find you know, in the hundreds it's 50 50 or even sometimes in favour of girls, but it just doesn't happen here. Now, obviously, the school curriculum should help to change that, I think, getting over that um, geeky image, if you like, of IT, because the media don't help, and things like um, the IT crowd, the programs like that, don't help you know, overcome that public perception. So that's that. Unconscious bias, you'll probably hear about because we've got a program which has been now around all the central boards and is being spread down to, or out to, uh, branch committees, for example. What we did find when we uh, did a survey, not a very scientific survey, to be honest, um, was that there were, there were plenty of examples when we asked of people who felt they were excluded. Um, in subtle ways um, at, at branch or member group events. Um, and uh, it's that unconscious bias, and people don't do it deliberately, but just simply by the way they do things um, can make people feel excluded. So we want to overcome that. We've got this training, which we've, we've had face to face training on the central uh, boards, but they're putting together a sort of event in the box, sort of online. Um, package which you'll get um, fairly soon, I think. Disability, we've recently joined something called the Business and Disability Forum, and again, we, you know, we, it's one of these things where we feel we should have done more over the years, um, and um, on accessibility and uh, tackling disability. So hopefully through that forum, which is a, a very big and well-resourced organisation, that we'd actually be able to do rather more than we have. Um, well, business of IT is a fairly sort of <clears throat> obvious point. I mean, we, want, we want to try and get away from the image that people in the BCS are just interested in hardware and software and, and um, technologies. Actually, what we're interested in is the use of IT in, in business. So, uh, 
we're engaging much more with, as the next point says, the digital community. So getting away from exclusively being in the uh, traditional IT areas. We see that kind of division between traditional IT and the digital agenda very, very starkly in some uh, companies, but also in government, uh, where the government departments tend to set up digital teams separate from their IT teams. We're actually, you know, believe it or not, through our garage systems, we'll bring them together. You'd think they'd do it themselves, but um, it, 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 it started to happen, but to a certain extent, from the efforts that we put in. Um, and we have an entrepreneurial activity in innovation and an entrepreneur and try to get more into SMEs because our group members, uh, large corporates, have signed, we've got various people like government departments and, and some big firms, but what we don't tend to get is SMEs interested in group membership of CS. And so driving up activity and membership. So, um, Okay, so I'm on the last of these now, we'll be pleased to know. Um, the international angle is always a difficult one for us, because although we've got, I think it's nearly 20,000 of our 70,000 clients are overseas, um, we don't really feel we do enough for them. So there are some very good branches overseas. And, uh, and for example, last year at one of our conventions, we had um, a guy from Hong Kong, and they really have an excellent um, association between the academic and the branch and the business sectors there, so that people in the branch um, do a lot of mentoring of young people um, coming out of the university and going into work. So an absolutely excellent example, which we obviously do more of in the UK. But, uh, so um, as I say, we, we struggle because of the geography, really. Um, but we do, in terms of our business activities, want to do more in, in emerging markets, you know, Markets, so. but it's not it's not easy. It tends to be much more difficult to break into, and uh, it takes it takes longer. So um, but that's uh, where we see growth coming in the future. Um, CITP is an international benchmark. Uh, yeah, well, there are equivalents of CITP in other places, but some places don't have a, a chartered equivalent of a chartered professional qualification variety at all. So that's like CITP to do. Ultimately, the, the license point a long way away. Right, so I've rattled through an awful lot of material there. Um, as I said at the start, we've got these five pillars, which are very, very broad in their scope. And the amount we're able to do in them is limited, obviously, by resources. So we try and concentrate on the areas where uh, we can actually make a difference, the school curriculum being one of those. Um, Obvious ones that we can be successful in. So my questions, really, if, if you're feeling inclined to have a little discussion at this point, how are we doing? Does that what I've said there was, does it feel right for you? So it's first we put together. I've got it in my bag, but we actually put together a, a single strategy document this year, uh, which is, is something we can sort of be proud of in terms of it, it, it hangs together nicely. The last few years we haven't really done that, and uh, it's been the absence has been quite uh, embarrassing. So at least we have something that looks like a, a strategy document, and those that I've just been going through are the essential elements in it. So um, does it feel right from what I said to you? Are there things that we should be putting more emphasis on or less emphasis on? Well, I think it's a great endorsing of document. I'm just terrified in six months' time we start bringing out something else, and that's what BCS has done in the past. We've done some really good policy, and then suddenly starts bringing out bits and pieces, and before we know it, we're into the mess we've ended up into just before um, our normal bit of flying sort of stuff out again. Um, but I get really mad when I see the word, the letters S N E. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I speak to Chamber of Commerce. It's a small business to Chamber of Commerce. It's someone employing 30 people. So the government is employing 200 people. And media enterprise is totally out of the league. Why do we lump them together? They're totally different. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not something that the SME label isn't something we use very much. I mean, we are 
increasingly we're trying to simply get into this, the very small business sector. Yes. That is the, the key tech hubs, like the obviously London, we've got the tech hub, the um, old um, and old street, um, the talking to down in Bristol, and in um, LPT markets, we have also got tech hubs. So we're, we're looking much more at that sector and doing things like mentoring. You know, it's, it's important. You know, Google used to employ 20 people. Does people realize that? But they weren't immediately a medium sized business. No. Those which were medium sized businesses are still medium sized businesses. So it's another area where the, you know, the, A, you've got you know, the recipients of, of any help we might offer have got to be you know, willing to listening. And a lot of SME is too busy, they're just not interested in what they have to offer. So you, you have to actually have to offer what they're really interested in, which is kind of, they're great at the technology, but they're probably not very good at the business. And they don't know how to run accounts and do their tax returns and things like that. That's why I find Chamber of Commerce is very good. I'm a rank and file member, I'm not a member of the committee here. I, I go to meetings here. I have been to a few meetings in London as well, with the London branch. I'm also a member of the London branch, but I have my own as well. Um, I'm, str I'm struggling with the identity thing. In other words, it sounds great that you're a bit like the Royal Academy, you have, want to have spokespeople, all the institute of directors, etc. So, as a rank and file member, I see this thing up in London that speaks on the behalf of the industry for me. I understand that. But that doesn't make me feel engaged. Yeah? And, and so the CIPD thing, how many people in this room are CIPD? CIGP. Well, whatever it is. Yeah, I, I know, I've 30 years in the industry. I was also a member of the IW for quite a few years, and they wanted me to become a chartered engineer. I never saw the attraction. It was a lot of work, a lot of money, and my employers throughout my whole career couldn't care less with that, to be honest. They were more interested in whether I had a professional qualification from a product manufacturer, you know, for example, uh, etc. So, so, I, so that doesn't engage me either, you know. And to be honest, most fun I get is from the Computer Conservation Society, but I'm also a member of um, as well. So, speaking now as a student, I am now a first year student in this institution. Um, I'm struggling to get engaged. It's costing me a lot of money every year. And, and I'll get this guy down too, but uh, uh, I'm struggling with this identity thing. So either you're going to be like these two directors, and, and I just pay my dues because you're fighting on my behalf, and I'm not really engaged, I just read the odd man. Or you're trying to pull me in and get me active. And at the moment, I'm not seeing any reason to get active, hence there's none of my fellow students in this room. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm struggling with that. Yeah. I, I just... Reasonable response. And they're very lordly. The, the, the wonderful visions and a nice work are huge. I used to work at HSBC and I was one of their CEOs in the technology area. Yeah. Um, and we used to have a vision and strategy statements like that and all that, that sort of stuff. And we also had trouble engaging our own rank and file because we had 24,000 IT people wanted, you know, um, et cetera. So, so I'm, I'm struggling still. Yeah, I have one of the things about joining professional bodies, it, it seems to be a generational thing. People of the older generation, I mean, it was it was kind of the thing we did, but younger people are not that interested. So you've actually got to sell it on the basis of benefits. And, well, you, you've enunciated several benefits. I mean, if you're really interested in computer conservation, join that specialist group with BCS. And of course, we've got dozens of specialist groups looking at the ever broadening uh, field of IT. So it's a, a great way of engaging with uh, your fellow. Not just fellow professionals, but people who are interested in that particular yeah. technology. It, it cost me £100 and whatever it is, pounds for yeah. uh, privilege. That's one of the cheapest yeah. among the professional bodies. It, it is, but I could probably go on to CCS meetings for free if yeah. that's what I, all, all I wanted. Yeah, I pay my dues, I've been a member for a number of years yeah. uh, because I believe in what, what we're doing in BCS. I just don't really get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, well, I mean, there are, obviously, it depends on your personal circumstances and how engaged you want to be. And, uh, you know, what I would turn it around and say, well, what can we do to provide something that will help you to be, be engaged? I mean, what, what are you looking for from BCS, which we're not doing? That's the way of turning that one around, I suppose. I don't want to be on BCS, I'm on BCS. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had, we had 
doing quite a lot to uh, try and make it more attractive. Lots of meetings are always full house. Yeah, yeah. Always full house. You have some interesting talking that people want to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the internet meeting, almost nothing because they charge the internet meetings. And I went along to their ATM and never went back again because the way they're running through by sending some suggestions. Not, not interested. Though, there's nothing happening there. CCS is great fun. We have a load of guys, grey hair like me, just having fun. Yeah. Can, can I follow on from that? Because like, I've spent more decades than I want to admit to trying to persuade undergraduates to join the BCS because I believe it's in their interests and, and being largely unsuccessful. I, all the strategies, Lord, all the high level goals are great, but if you really want to increase the membership, I think you need some practical intervention at that point as, as people graduate and join the profession. Um, because they do realise that they don't need to join the BCS. No one's going to ask for it. They, you know, um, so, well, I guess what BCS has to do is it has to put pressure to make employers require it more, or just to sneak it in as an added bonus. I mean, if BCS were a go-between between employers for sandwich years, uh, and uh, finding jobs. So I'm just acting as a marriage broker between industry and people graduating with degrees in IT. And BC, you know, well, you have to join BCS, but we'll give you a cheap deal as part of it. People, people would join at that point, and I, and I think you really want to get more than uh, whatever it is, eight percent of the profession as, as members. In, some practical action. That, I'm, I'm making sense. There's some practical action yeah. at that point. Yeah. So, so, so the students. So you have a national careers advice section of this, this university. They are in your face every minute of every day, and they're sitting in the library, and there are dozens of people in there, and they're setting up the internships in the summer, and they're setting up. You could match that. Not in every institution in the country. Absolutely not. No, no. no. amount of resources. Yeah. So, but, but there is a lot that can be done at branch level, of course. I mean, I have spoken to. Are we talking about branch level and student membership? Brighton University for several years yes. gave free membership to all their IT students yeah. who requested stuff from Swindon. They sent somebody down to talk to the students. They did tell us they were coming. They gave the university, they ran the day before, and nothing. A few students turned up. I went to one of the presentations, quite frankly, if I went to that presentation, I would have said, I'm not joining BCS, full stop. I get a free newspaper called Computing. And uh, I can get in contact with people if I want to mentor them. These are first year students. I'm not saying you're joining a private profession, this is cutting edge for who you keep you from. none of that. I mean, the, a simple question is why didn't the BCS start LinkedIn? <laughs> for IT, you would have got 2 million people on it. Uh, if the technology they could. Yeah. I mean, don't uh, forget that the BCS sent teams to spend two or three days at this university in Brighton, validating the degrees oh, yeah. mm -hmm. to make sure they meet the standards of the industry. Yeah. I mean, those teams could maybe get a little bit heavier about how many people are, are joining the profession, or you know, what are you saying to the students about yeah. ultimately this is going to be a licensed profession. Yeah, I've heard that comment before. I, mean, I think we're a little bit too precious about separating accreditation well, well, that's a point where, where that's the sort of point where you go put the pressure on to get people to join. I, I, mean, that really that work. I mean, if you try to credit people, how many developers, citizens, whatever it is, of your acquaintance are self-taught? Well, I hide and buy thousands of people every year because I run the offshore centers. Yeah. I didn't want whether they had any interest in the BCS at all. Sure, but I mean, where do you go? You'll be a lawyer. Yeah, they want a self-taught lawyer. I just hope they're not. <laughs> but I mean, you know what I mean? People are self-taught IT because they love IT when they're eight. Yeah. So you say, oh, you have to be CIT. Well, that's great if you're, you know, you go on bank. Yeah. You know, you can't accept that. But most IT, most companies say, I just want competent people who do a good job. Yeah, yeah. Right. and they're not going to necessarily have to get this course on. You have to do all these exams that are irrelevant. And of course, this comes back to my original, what I was replying to, 
that's just that. But the implication is, the implication of all this, is that the competent, the current IT people, aren't very competent. And actually, I don't see any evidence, except from some public sectors, <laughs> that people are not very competent. We, we actually, I see these people have been pretty, pretty, pretty competent. We, we did ask for accreditation in a couple of specialist fields, like TOGAP for architects, yeah. like the yeah. security stuff that's coming yeah. out, mm. and then being a professional security person, because um, we couldn't test that. You know, so, so there's some specialist stuff where accreditation was good. The general, a Java programmer, don't care. You know, they've been college learned Java. We actually had to reteach them anyway. You know, once, once they join. To be honest, I mean, my choice, big bullet exactly as you say, what we were looking for were Microsoft certified engineers and Cisco yeah. engineers. That's what we're looking for. I guess, I guess to be fair, there are more larger corporates now who do require license to work. Some of that may be formal certification, and some may be um, more hybrid experience, but uh, maybe so, it's certainly it's my, my, maybe I know, like IBM, my, BP, BP are heavy into license to work for various uh, technology and related professionals, and that involves everything from uh, the softer skills of stakeholder management to if you're um, an enterprise architect having the appropriate um, certification and helping you achieve that, for instance. And that is something that they have involved uh, the BCS in a little bit, but it's been primarily driven by um, internal requirements for improving reliability and Improving safety and reliability to the business. I am like corporate university. Absolutely agree. The mm -hmm. nice certification globally, worldwide, uh, on everything that we did. Occasionally, we did say require public certification as well. Those are like security stuff. So we would sponsor people and say, "Happy you to take the external exams, yep. you know, and then because it's better for us, you know, that you're certified, etc." But a general you know, certified professional blanket thing, which didn't work for us. We didn't pass that. We wanted specialist skills. Oh. I think, so, you know, just part of what you said about maturity, you know, it has to have been around for 100 plus years. You see, it's not just the institutions, you know. I, 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 was, I had a group to do the Law Society for many years with the people who run the Law Society. And it's not just the institutions. Institutions, is it? It's the it's it's it's, it's IT. Yeah, it, it just isn't the mature subject. We couldn't do, we didn't even know what it is. What is IT as a subject, as a discipline? Yeah, it's, it's incredibly unclear. Whereas the law is very simple. You apply a lawyer for the courts, right? You apply a lawyer for the courts. You all people want to have blah 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 blah. But the court is where it ends, and that's what you do with lawyers. It's not complicated. Same with Williams. Same with Williams. That's exactly right. But that's because after you know, 2,000 years of trying to do it, you now have vagueness on how to build the house. Don't want it to fall down. It won't necessarily fall down immediately. But within IT, we clearly don't know what IT is. Partly because it changes so much. Yeah? But also, partly is because it's becoming apparent it's just going to be in all parts of everyone's lives. You know, three year old in iPads and all that stuff. So, I'm, I'm old and I'm cranky and I'm you know, cynical. I just don't think that this idea, perhaps in very limited ways in the you know, public that it's great, but I just can't see what being certified as an employer would mean. If you know, someone said to me, I've got this you know, CITP, I'll you look it up, and we think, so what does it mean? What does it tell me? I interview for a developer, I get a team of guys in the room, and I ask them, you know, questions about because I want to know have they got the right kind of mind to do with Yeah. Right. I don't care about how good are your C plus plus skills. Yeah? I can do a test and in ten minutes I can see that. Have got the right kind of mind. And you just can't get that no, from a CIT. In fact, to be honest with you, people who like doing qualifications, frankly, are generally speaking, the kind of people who just want to be managers. 
And if this country needs anything less, that's more managers. We need more, you know, monkeys at the coal face and fewer managers. So I think yeah, it does, well. mean, does mean people who are certified in a broad range of things, and as a CIGP and FPCS assessor, the interesting thing is, is that the people who do want the certification, a lot of them we're finding from Middle East, uh, Asia, Sri Lanka, particularly Hong Kong, was mentioned, where because perhaps of the, the tighter bonds between industry and university, it seems to be a requirement or expected. Yeah. Yes, it's a differentiator. Absolutely. It's tighter bonds. Yeah, yeah. Tighter bonds yes. between industry and university. But there is another problem. Mm -hmm. Another profession has the same problem as well. Mm -hmm. They have an institute going for much longer than us, and that's the Institute of Bankers. Yes. The Institute of Bankers, up until Big Bang, you could not work in the bank, you could not be a senior manager unless you're a member of the Institute of Bank. If I got part, part one, you have part one, part two, there's more part A and B. And that includes all various things. And at the moment, it also includes quite a lot of IT element, not uh, word processing skills, but IT, so you do understand where things can go wrong. And how many of the chairmen of the banks of the big sets, how many of them are professionally part of the industry of bank? There's only one, and that's Stanford and Charles. So they've got a big problem, and people said, but most of, most of these people. Stuart does it. Stuart, Stuart Gulliver's FSA registered, and um, Douglas Flint's and Stuart Accountants. Yeah, but um, Institute of Bankers, I'm talking about. Um, I don't care what other qualification they've got, it's called banking. And banking is a unique thing. You really got to know what's going on. And the same with our profession, it does cover everything else. But I can say I am an IT specialist because I am an electrical engineer. It's not quite the same thing. Because well, electrical engineer can mean many things. Well, what level of resource has the BCS got to, to, to drive the strategic plan? I mean, we spoke outside, we usually used to get 200 people. But uh, the majority of them are tied up with theme generation work. So, so what sort of resources have we got? 10, 20, 50? Yeah, it's in that sort of number. I mean, yeah. it, we have, um, if we get tired of it, we will, but um, we did a year ago uh, separate out commercial activity. So that out of those 200 now, I'm not quite sure what the number is. It's, it's just over a majority, 100 and something, uh, work on the commercial side. And, and they, you know, their raison d'etre is to earn um, a surplus, we didn't actually manage it last year, but to earn a surplus uh, to pay for things like branches and yes. all the other more specialist group activity. Um, and indeed our board. So um, that's the divide. And then on the institute side, the non-commercial side, obviously there's a membership team. Um, you have to manage you know, the income on membership. So they're semi-self-financing, but, but not really. But um, the, the other numbers who are doing things like the academy work, um, like the public policy work, and simply the, the administration and the boards and so on. Yeah, the numbers there are quite small. Yeah. So the actual total is 20 or 30 people probably. Yeah. Um, and it does mean, as I said before, that we do have to be quite selective about that one too. But I think you know the, the value of the professional qualification, if, if I put MBCS or CITP after my name, it means I care enough um, to, to be interested in that. I mean, the very fact that it doesn't make much difference to your career is, if you, if you like, is, is kind of a positive in the sense that um, I didn't do it to develop my career. You might say, well, people get their more qualifications simply because they have to have it in order to practice. Um, we don't have to do that, but what it does do is it says something about me as an individual that I've signed up for a code of conduct, which is backed by a dis you know, disciplinary process. Um, that I do recognize, and if you look at our five pillars, only one of those is about professional development, about numbers, the other four are about benefits to society. So I've signed up to an organization that takes very seriously its, its um, responsibility to society, and there are all sorts of things in which, you know, as we just talked about, there's so many things that we can do and do do to a certain extent to benefit society rather than simply benefit our numbers. So, you know, what I would say to you is it says something about you as a person that um, you are interested enough to want to do that.
but it's 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 thin grow. It, that's a very thin subject for you know graduates, people just about to graduate, or people starting on their career. I think. Okay. Um, you mentioned the IT crowd <laughs> and the image. No, no, I mean, uh, uh, this is a serious point, really. Um, is, is anyone in BCS actively engaged with the media in terms of generating a positive or at least more realistic image? Yeah. Because the psychology department here is still swollen, and they tell me this is this is the effect of a TV program called Cracker. Yeah. Um, and if there were to be a program glamorizing work in the IT industry, yeah. then things would change massively. I mean, is, is, is anyone in the in institute actually talking, well, like, actively talking to the media about this sort of thing? We, I'd like to say yes, but when, you know, it's whether they're listening or not really, isn't it? We can talk as much as we like, if they're not listening, it's probably very good. Um, you know, the number of things one could say there, I mean, science has become much more popular. Recent years, yeah. Big Bang Theory, for example. Yeah. And, and people like, well, people like, remember, one of Brian Cox, you know, I mean, yes. he's just a great advocate for science and people, young people, particularly in politics. We had a, a Brian Cox equivalent in the United States. We might have one. Ah. Sure. But I mean, surely, lots of IT is not really very glamorous. No, yeah. well, you're right. We have a and we say you've got this fantastic career. Yeah. John, they would suggest that. I'm going to go and be something useful where I can have lots of meetings or something, whatever it is you yeah. people like. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Surely, we want to get. I don't know, there's a lot of different careers in <laughs> the right, right. right. There's yeah. not just programming. No, there's sure there's not. There's also a lot of myths about pay levels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, again, all the engineering professions yeah. suffer from this myth about pay. But, um, yeah, yeah. An average engineer or an average person in the IT crowd on a support desk is a fairly low-paid job, and that's what people see as being, you know, the kind of career they can aspire to. The globalisation, more and more, so yes. Yeah. Well, um, however, when you actually look at the sets, I have to be good in just computer students. That's all they want: is computer students, not to do IT, yeah. but to work for Goldman Sachs in banking. Yes, because they've got the right mind. Yeah, yeah, logical mind. You had the end, had the end, with the only history. Yeah, I'm saying nothing. But um, <laughs> but it, you know the pay the pay thing is a myth because when you actually get to the chartered level, whichever profession you're looking at, um, the pay levels are high. But the average pay for the chartered IT professionals is on a par with chartered engineers, on a par with the equivalent in the other professions. And in the emerging economies, IT is actually a premium. Yeah, which is why most of the people in India go into IT now, not because they like IT, because it pays well. Fifty percent of the people I employ. And nationally we suffer, don't we? Because we don't get enough talented people going into the profession. So could, could you say, Roger, that you, you talked about the work that's happened uh, for the new curriculum. Could you maybe say some uh, specific uh, aspects of that? Uh, maybe drill down, say what you think might attract or retain people into IT technology type hybrid roles in the future through that early learning experience, what do you think is really going to grab their attention? Well, you know, it's, it's funny to say this, isn't it? But coding, actually giving people a chance to uh, make the computer work and do things for them. And in the earlier generation, that was BBC Micro, wasn't it? And now it's Raspberry Pi. Yes. And um, yeah, so we see a great growth in code clubs and schools. Uh, we do see more people taking it up. And, uh, I was convention today, somebody from the university said their um, applications for courses has gone up this year. I don't know if it's the same here, but uh, you know, I think that, you know, the publicity which the curriculum change is, is getting um, is actually helping, uh, helping that. But yeah, I think like, you know, getting people, even really quite young children, uh, because the technology is so available now, you know, you have these, these simple languages which are don't know about it, but you know, the, the, the young system used to um, program a device to do something, which is a Raspberry Pi or whatever, is a, is a potential motivator. Okay. I'm not, not sure what to see that as a career in IT, but you see yeah. it's making the computer do something. Yeah, but it's a start. It's a it's the computer. Yeah, but it's a start. It, it is may a start. just spark their interest, and they, they want to go in deeper. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. 
course you're going to get it when you both you've got half and five years, which is how I can go on. It's great. But I mean, just to make my you know, first point at the end, if you're asking the one thing, I think that all the effort could go to have a real, you know, to make a real, you know, a long term difference is to get us to all have more informed customers. <laughs> because you know, dealing with people who actually seem to believe in magic is just it's just one damn thing after another. Yeah. And I mean you, you know, you mentioned, you, mentioned um, you, know, you, you mentioned public sector problems and yeah. I mean I've worked in the public sector before I retired and you can see the same mistakes being made over and over. You've got you know the latest one of disaster just about happening is the universal credit. And it's naivety it's on the part yeah. of politicians. You know, so the prince to begin with. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, national program for health. How many billions that's wasted? That yeah. was because some smart consultant sat on Tony Blair's sofa and yeah. sold the idea to him. And uh, you know, that's where these disasters tend to start. But I mean, surely that could never happen if we had, you know, if this guy and you know, all of these guys worked in, in. In the public sector, you just want to get smart Alex from you know, the young man, you are saying, Yeah, well, I don't know what more money in private, but yeah, yeah. But yeah. How, many, how many members of parliament come from even engineering professions? Do you whole? need to, surely you just need to, you know, you just need to be you know, better informed. I mean, I'm sure in Hong Kong, yeah, the managers in industry are just yeah. simply better informed, yeah, they haven't got any experts, well, they just have to. You look at the Chinese cabinet, and out of 20 members, 18, I think, are engineers. That's right. They graduate 800,000 engineers a year. Yeah. In China. 800,000. If you want the double student population, every subject added together in this country. <laughs> it's a big country. Well, the media studies. Yeah. Well, the social studies. Well, well, that, that, that <laughs> big yeah. But in China, if you're a student at university, you don't turn up for electric, you don't turn up. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't want to go wholesale on what we do, but what we want to do is try and address that balance. Yes. Because if you look at the makeup of the civil service, of uh, parliament, whatever, there just aren't enough people. Um, well, we just to to okay, and you, we you might have time for right. one more question. I just noticed a security guard lurking at back this point. Yeah. Please, at us. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> so if we could do maybe one or two final questions. Project, please. Sort of not do I have pretty much. Lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. I didn't put things I could have covered tonight. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you send me the slides? Yeah. Do you want to run the website? There's a load more slides. Well, it's better. That'll be good. Yeah. Put that on the website. Yes. If that's okay, yeah, sure, yeah. that would be great. To yeah. Okay, so uh, to uh, bring the meeting uh, to a close, thank you very much for attending. I uh, show your appreciation to Roger. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a fantastic talk next month that you should all come to. I can't remember for the life of me what it is. If anyone knows, please do tell me. If not, when you get the calling notice, you'll see that I'm not lying. You should be here, and we look forward to seeing you. Thank you very much for coming, ladies and gentlemen. And um, may uh, may your troubles not be on it. <laughs> <laughs>